I'm Ben Barrows. I'm the Dean of the College of Law, and it's my great pleasure today to introduce Professor David Harris from the University of Pittsburgh School of Law, who will be giving our lecture as part one of the Stranahan Nationals Issue Forum. Part two will be on November 2nd, where we will have Heather McDonald from the Manhattan Institute. Professor Harris is Distinguished Faculty Scholar at the University of Pittsburgh School of Law. He teaches criminal law, criminal procedure, and evidence. He taught here at the University of Toledo College of Law through 2007, where he was the Eugene Balk Professor of Law and Values. Professor Harris is the leading national authority on racial profiling. He, uh, his first law journal articles about profiling became the basis for the Traffic Stop Statistics Act of 1997, the first national legislative proposal in the nation to attempt to address profiling. His 2002 book, Profiles and Injustice, Why Racial, Racial Profiling Cannot Work, and his research on profiling led to Reform Act efforts by the federal government, by more than half the states, and by hundreds of police departments. He's testified numerous times in the United States Congress and before many state legislatures. His other books include Good Cops, The Case for Preventative Policing, and Failed Evidence, Why Law Enforcement Resists Science. In the wake of the recent events in Ferguson, Missouri, and elsewhere, Professor Harris has had the opportunity to work with police departments, governments, and citizen groups around the country on police community relations, body cameras for police, police accountability, and racial profiling. He gives speeches and professional training for police departments, judges, attorneys, community groups. He's a leading national expert uh, consulted by the media very routinely. Uh, in March 2015, Professor Harris received the Jefferson Award for Public Service in recognition of his national and local work bringing together law enforcement and the communities they serve in order to build mutual trust, justice, and public, sa public safety. So please join me in welcoming Professor David Harris. Well, hi. It's great to be here. Great to be back with all of you. Uh, I see so many familiar faces. It's nice to see you again. And to those I haven't met, uh, I look forward to being able to chat with you later. Uh, and to give you what I got right here, uh, for me, this is really coming home. Uh, and I thank the, uh, the, the dean for his nice introduction. I thank the Stranahan people uh, for inviting me, making me part of this conversation on race and policing after Ferguson. Um, it's, a, uh, it's a very provocative time, a very difficult time. It's a time of a lot of introspection and a lot of noise as well. And I think to have the opportunity to really dissect some of what is going on, uh, it's a really good thing. I'm glad we're all here to do this uh, together. Um, so let's, uh, let's just get right into it. Uh, if you take yourself back to August uh, of 2014, you may remember scenes like this. Uh, police officers who, for all intents and purposes, looked like soldiers uh, with uh, rather large weapons, uh, facing civilian populations in an American town. Uh, this kind of scene was not unusual. Here's a woman, she's uh, doing something very American. If you, if you note, she's holding a sign. Uh, she's a protester, uh, and the, she finds herself on the ground with a gun pointed at her. Uh, here's uh, another comparable image, a uh, lady with a small child facing a line of police. And then this, uh, I got to say, this was really striking to a lot of people and to, to especially to veterans of the Iraq and Afghanistan conflicts. Uh, I thought some of their, their comments were so interesting. They, they looked at this image, and this was one of many like this around the country, protesters, hands up, facing a military style vehicle on top of it, police officers, soldiers, whatever they look like to you. Uh, and one of them with a large weapon trained on these people. And the reaction of the veterans was, what is this? I mean, in, in Iraq and Afghanistan, we couldn't do this. This is against our rules of engagement. We're not allowed to do this. And here we are in the United States. It's happening right here. And this is the United States. Look in the background, there's McDonald's, right? 
And this is what we have going on here. This is an image that stayed with me, uh, that really did strike me. Uh, and it's because the, the signs, I am a man and now I am a woman, the reason that this was so striking to me is that I'm old enough to remember this, like I know some of you might be. The 50s and 60s, the protests in Memphis and in Selma and so many other places, this was one of the standard signs, and here we are. So uh, we need to ask ourselves some difficult questions. Uh, so we need to be open to possibilities that maybe we wouldn't have been before. And I think the clash of ideas on these issues has really started to emerge in some ways, some of which are productive and some of which are not. So that's why I was so eager to have the opportunity to come and speak to you about this. So the most important point that I think I can make today is that some of this is about race, but some of it is not. All of it is about how we're going to do policing, how we should be doing policing going forward in this new century. Right? Some of that has heavy racial overtones. Some of it is just about how we, we get public safety, that we get to that point. All of it all of it could not be more important to who we are as a country right now and who will be in 10 years and 15 and 20 years. So how are we doing? What shape should law enforcement take going forward? There are real live questions about this. So issue number one, I'm going to talk about four things. Here's the first one, history. History, and I, I, this is not because I'm at a university, but history is crucial. With race and criminal justice, we are never, ever writing on a blank slate. There's always history. It's always present. Every time there's an encounter between a police officer and an African American and, or, or, or other minority communities, history is present, and it makes a difference. Um, I've been sort of preaching this uh, for some time now. Uh, and imagine my surprise. I was, I, was, uh, I was preparing for a talk back in February. I was going to talk about this. I heard, uh, oh, the director of the FBI is going to give a talk on race and law enforcement, which is an unusual thing since, A, the FBI doesn't have a great record on this, and B, they're not really interested usually in addressing it because they're not a street-level policing organization for the most part, like a city police department is. But I, you know, I checked it out, and I found something incredible. Here's James Comey, the director of the FBI, and this was the very first point that he made. Now, I'll read this to you because I know it's small. He says, first, all of us in law enforcement must be honest enough to acknowledge that most of our, much of our history is not pretty. At many points in American history, law enforcement enforced a status quo that was often brutally unfair to disfavored groups. We cannot forget our law enforcement legacy because the people we serve cannot forget it either. Boy, I wish I'd said it like that. Let's talk about what that legacy is, what that history is, and maybe we'll see why it's so important. Among the very first American police departments in terms of organized policing groups were the slave patrols. These were originally little gangs, posses, whatever you want to call them, but they were organized into regular law enforcement organizations pre-Civil War, usually in the American South, but also in some border states. The slave patrols would have the right to stop any black person they saw without a white person and demand proof that the, that the black person was out there with permission. Uh, uh, there had to be something tangible or else the black person could and would be taken into custody. The slave patrols also had the power to go into any black home, any black community. They go right into a home. Of course, warrants? Ah, we don't need any warrants. They could seize contraband. What kind of contraband? Oh, things like books, because it was illegal to have books or to teach slaves to read. These were police departments, and that is what the interaction was like for black people in those times. Here's something. Uh, this is one of those permissions, if you will. This is a badge. Uh, the number at the top is 47. And it says on here, Charlotte, North Carolina, servant at the bottom, 1841. This is the kind of thing that would be pinned on a black person's clothes when they were sent out on an errand and that the slave patrols could demand or check. 
Here is its opposite. Plantation police along the top, along the bottom. Runaway slave patrol, Georgetown County, South Carolina, 1858. This is law enforcement. This is its history. All right. Now, fast forward to the Civil Rights Movement. Jumped a long ways here, more than 100 years. Now, when we think about the Civil Rights Movement now, there's the movie Selma, there's all kinds of things. We're, we're, we're kind of celebrating it. We think of it as a very noble moment. Most of us do anyway in our history in the modern era. Right? It was when African Americans demanded their true due under the Constitution. They demanded that all men be treated as if they were created equal, that they be equal under the law. So here are these young men. They are sitting at a lunch counter, an iconic image, desegregating a southern lunch counter. And this is kind of one of the things that we have in our minds when we think civil rights movement. But there was a lot more. There was a lot more, and a lot of it really is illuminating when we think about the history of law enforcement. Here is the role of police in the civil rights movement. It isn't to guard the protesters. It isn't to keep groups of people apart so everybody can have a nice, safe demonstration. What law enforcement did in this era, in these places, they served as the tip of the spear to these very ugly laws and customs. Here are some people sitting in a booth uh, in a restaurant, and this police officer is basically laying down the law. You're not here, you're not where you're supposed to be. You got to get out of there, you're going to face arrest. Similar image. Here are some uh, women, and they had the temerity to do something like, uh, you know, try to get registered for school or whatever it was. And instead of just being told, uh, uh, sure, here, we'll accept your registration, they are walked away by the police. And then there are dogs. These pictures, these images from this time are full of police and dogs. All right? This was one of the things you saw over and over in this era if you were paying attention. Dogs used to frighten protesters, dogs used as weapons against protesters. Here's another one. You can see the police officer is restraining this dog, but giving the dog enough room to actually tear into this man. And here, this one is, for some reason, this one really sticks with me all the time. You see the man who's almost in the center of the image. He is standing there and one vicious dog is up in his face, teeth bared. The other one is tearing at him from the back. His clothing is ripped. I mean, it's terrifying. It's terrifying. And these dogs are under the control of the police. Control. For sure, they're being allowed to do this. And look through the picture, you see not just those two dogs, I see at least three others. This was meant to be used this way. The dogs were meant to be used like that. They were a tool of terror, uh, not to mention the physical damage that they could do. And I mean, this, th this image has never left me. Which is why last August, 2014, when I opened up the newspaper, and I saw this. I thought, what? Who is giving the orders down there? Who doesn't know their history? Who does not understand the symbolic power of using a dog this way? Now, to be sure, this officer is signaling, don't come any closer or something like that. But there's the dog. There's the dog. And there's, you know, here's another one. Right, that dog looks, for all intents and purposes, like all those others. Now, that officer may not think of this as a message, but that dog is a message. That officer might not know any of that history, but that dog is giving a message to those people who are there with their hands up and their cell phones out and their signs. Know your history. If you don't, if you don't acknowledge it and understand it, you will make mistakes. That's the best and most gentle way I can put it. And mistakes like this happen all the time during the, the events in Ferguson. So know that history. It's present, whether you were alive then or not. All right. What could you do about this? How about education? In police training, there's a lot of training on the use of firearms, a lot of training on writing reports, a lot of training on the uniform, on driving the squad cars, on working within the organization in every way you could imagine. 
Not much on history. Not much on the history of law enforcement. Wouldn't it be a good thing if this was part of not only the academy training, but a standard part of in-service training? All right? Because if you know your history, you may have different reactions and different ways of going about the same task. All right, so that's point number one. What about use of force? I mean, there's nothing really that has stirred people up and gotten them angry and got them asking questions more than the way that police use force. And this is a sort of question I get a lot, all right? In the wake of some incident, usually, the question looks like this. Why hasn't that police officer been arrested? If that was me, I would, have been, I would already be in jail, even if it was self-defense or something, and they're doing nothing. Why, why, why? Well, let's take a few minutes and really understand this, all right? Because again, race is woven through here, but this is more than just a racial issue. This is a, this is a strongly legal context that we have to understand, too. All right, police and the use of force. Here's the thing. Police have the right, the privilege, even sometimes the duty to use force, unlike you and I. Right? They have the right to use reasonable and proportional force to perform their jobs. Right? This is the law. Civilians can sometimes, in very limited situations, use force. Self-defense. Right? Self-defense. If you're under unjustified attack, you can defend yourself. Other than that, no. Police have the right and sometimes even the duty to use force enough to overcome whatever force or resistance they face in order to get their jobs done. They can't use more than is necessary. So if a person, a protester, let's say, is hugging onto a pillar and saying, I won't go, I won't go, police can't shoot them. That would be excessive force. But they can use enough force to overcome that to make a legal arrest. All right? And here's the law. How much? Well, whatever's reasonable. Oh, there's a problem there. We'll come back to it in a second. Uh, in the particular situation, and the case is Graham versus Connor from 1989, the Supreme Court says, um, here's the question you ask, whether the officer's actions are objectively reasonable in light of the facts and circumstances confronting them without regard to their underlying intent or motivation. So it's an objective standard. It isn't this officer. It's what would a reasonable officer have done under the idea that they can use reasonable force. That word, reasonable, is obviously quite elastic. All right? it is not, it's not possible to define that. What's reasonable in one circumstance will not be reasonable in another. You hope that what's reasonable in courtroom A will be reasonable in courtroom B, and it's opposite, but you know, that maybe you run into problems there. One thing that a lot of people say about this standard is that it favors the police. And I think probably, objectively, that's true. Whether you think that's a good thing or not, that's the policy question. Should the law favor police in the use of force? They do need to use force. Let's face it, they do. There are situations where it's, there's just no alternative. So how do you want that force to be judged? That's the question. But they have the right to use force. So the question with police is not whether they use force. It's whether that force was excessive. Was it excessive in light of the circumstances? Did it exceed the bounds of reasonableness given what the officer was facing? All right. This sets up a series of problems when you talk about charging or prosecuting police officers. And this is where people really, I think, get angry and don't really understand what the real problems are. So let's see if I can illuminate it just a little bit. Was the force excessive? And of course, we're having this discussion on the day that there are motions before courts in Baltimore to discuss the, the case in which uh, six officers have been indicted in the death of uh, Freddie Gray. And they're arguing today about change of venue. All right? So this is very much a live issue, absolutely 100%. So let's start with jurors, all right? You're going to try a case against police officers almost certainly in front of a jury if that case ultimately comes to trial. Uh, some kinds of police cases where police are defendants will go to the bench, but usually they go to juries. Juries will come in to courtrooms with a certain story in their heads 
they come in with a, with a pre-existing narrative, as all of us would in any situation. We always have this pre-existing story, but for jurors, when they come in, the story is, the narrative is, police officers are the good guys. They're the good guys. Now, not every juror thinks this, maybe not happen in every jury situation, but overwhelmingly, jurors serving will come in with that story. And you know what? They're generally right. You know, police usually are the good guys. But when you charge a police officer, even in a strong case, when you charge a police officer, you sit him down in the defendant's chair and you say, this police officer is on trial and these are the criminal charges, what you're asking the jurors to do is to turn that internal world upside down, to take that usual narrative and say, uh, upside down. You're asking them to think things that seem completely alien to, to them. And it's human nature to resist that. So that makes these cases hard to try and hard to win, and therefore, they're less likely to be brought just because of that. Next, prosecution by local prosecutors. This poses its own set of problems, its own set of issues. Local prosecutors, your county DA, your county state's attorney, try the great bulk of cases in the United States. The federal prosecution operation is significant, but it's, it's comparatively small. Right? So most cases against police are going to be tried in a state court most of the time. Now, if you're a local prosecutor, we can be sure of several things. And the most important one is you're working hand in glove with the police every day. The police bring the prosecutors the cases, the prosecutors take them to trial. The police serve as witnesses, prosecutors are the lawyers. They have a continuing relationship. Right? Now this doesn't mean they always like each other or trust each other. Right? Sometimes there's a lot of distrust. But they're roughly speaking on the same team. This would naturally make any local prosecutor reluctant to bring charges. And we see this over and over and over again. The history of local prosecution of police officers is essentially that, a hesitancy to prosecute local police officers. It just isn't easy, and local prosecutors don't want to do it. Not to say it's never done, but there's real hesitation. There is that relationship. Now, we know there's another level, right? So the local prosecutors, let's say they won't do it. What about the federal prosecutors? And every area in this country is covered not just by a local jurisdiction, a state jurisdiction, but a federal jurisdiction, too. And those lawyers, those prosecutors, do not have this relationship with local police. I mean, they do work with them sometimes. But it certainly isn't this close relationship. The federal prosecutors don't have that. So they, theoretically, could go ahead and prosecute. But here's the thing. They have a whole other set of hurdles. It is the job of a local prosecutor to prove excessive force was used and to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. Right? That's the local case. The federal prosecutors have to do that. And then they also have to prove a willful violation of the Constitution. So not only was excessive force used, they also have to show that it was done with the purpose of violating the Constitution. That, my friends, is really hard. Right? That is probably the, the heaviest criminal burden in the system that anybody carries. So excessive force used and a willful violation of the Constitution. And you know, that is just really hard to do. And you, 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 know, you add to that that a lot of these cases, you, know, you have police on one side of them, and sometimes the victims had checkered pasts. Uh, if the victim survives the use of force, those things will be used against the victim. These are much harder cases to prove than people generally understand. Now, with that extra burden, how does it shake out with federal prosecutors? Well, I have some numbers for you. Um, we looked at 10 years of investigations of police by the United States Department of Justice and federal prosecutors. They're all basically one unit. And we looked at how many cases they get and what they do with them. All right, so over a, over a 10 year period, from the years 2002 to 2011, the numbers here are approximate. I'll give you in, in ranges, all right? 
So in any given year, the Department of Justice and federal prosecutors investigate between 9 and 12,000 cases of excessive force. 9 to 12,000 a year are investigated. They indict 30 to 40. Right? Why? Hard cases, sometimes not so good witnesses, all the things I'm talking about, the upside down narrative, the high burden of proof. And how many do they actually get a guilty verdict in? It's 15 to 20. All right? So it, it starts out with this big number and very quickly goes way, way down. All right? That's the real picture. All right? So people come in, they demand federal investigation and so forth. You've got to understand what you're dealing with. This is a lot harder for prosecutors to do than I think people realize, sometimes because of the, the relationship that exists locally and sometimes because of the law itself. So what could we do about this? A couple ideas for you. Um, we can take the, pro the investigation and prosecution of uh, use of force deaths out of the hands of local prosecutors. And this has been done in a couple of places. They create a statewide or jurisdiction-wide unit that comes in, does the investigation, and makes the decision whether or not to prosecute. At least we get rid of that local quasi-conflict of interest. On the federal side, that law that requires willful violation of the Constitution, all right, it needs some help, okay? What if you had a murder, a set of murder statutes? Any state, you have murder statutes. First degree, second degree, manslaughter, first degree, second degree, negligent homicide. You have a whole host of offenses you could choose from. In the federal system, it's like you only have first degree. There's only one possibility. So at the very least, we need a new statute to add to the existing one that will have a standard of recklessness. Instead of willfulness, which is sort of purposeful, intentional violation of the Constitution, we should think about a law that requires only, still a lot, but only that the person be reckless, that they have a conscious awareness of the law, uh, of the possibility of a violation, and they choose to ignore it. All right? A lower standard. So you at least have some alternatives. Okay. That's issue number two. Now number three, and this has gotten a ton of press lately. The Ferguson effect. The Ferguson effect, okay? How many have heard the phrase? A few of you, all right. Um, the, the chief exponent of the Ferguson effect has been your next speaker. This is Heather McDonald, all right? She wrote pieces in the Wall Street Journal back at the end of May and in the middle of June saying that the Ferguson effect was what we had to be conscious of now, that this was the thing that was causing the most problems in the months since the incident in Ferguson. What does she mean by the Ferguson effect? Well, she says we're experiencing a new nationwide crime wave. And what is causing it? She says, the most plausible explanation of the current surge in lawlessness is the intense agitation against American police departments over the past nine months. The incessant drumbeat against the police, uh, she says, and I'm quoting here, has empowered criminals. Right? That is her statement right? in the Wall Street Journal, May 30th, 2015. And it, it had significant impact. A lot of people picked this up. Now, you may have noticed that in the last two to three weeks, I would say, uh, this is not being talked about as the Ferguson effect. It's been kind of renamed and rebottled. It's the fault of Black Lives Matter. Right? And you can see that you just flip on any cable channel any night of the week now, and Black Lives Matter is causing the empowerment of criminals, and that's resulting in a surge of crime and especially crime and murder against police officers. All right. So what I suggest is that we take this apart and we look at the evidence and see what we think. All right. uh, in her piece, uh, Ms. McDonald cited three main pieces of evidence that showed a new nationwide crime wave. All right. The first was that in New York City during these first five months of 2015, because remember it was May, May 30th that she published this, homicides were up in New York City. And New York City, of course, is famously the place where the 
slide over 20 years in crime in the United States, the great decrease started. So if homicides are up in New York City, that really means something. She says, number two, homicides are up in Los Angeles. And number three, murders of police, up 89% in 2014, the last year for which data were then available. 89%. I've talked about more things, but these were her, her chief anchors of her argument. This is the nationwide crime wave. So let's take each of these in turn and see what the data shows us. Right? But before we do that, let's talk about one general principle. Because when you talk about a new crime wave or a or a, a trend in crime, right? She is talking about from at May 31st, May 30th, 2015, the first five months of the year. And sometimes she talks about the nine months between the Ferguson incidents and riding there and so forth and May 31st, May 30th, 2015. So it's five months, it's nine months, different places in her writing, all right? Here's the question. Is five months a trend? Is nine months a trend? Is that, is that enough to make this judgment? I'll give you a hint. No. <laughs> no. It's, just, it's not. Okay? No responsible person who's handling data, a criminologist, nobody who does this for a living would ever say that five months measuring crime is a, is a trend or signifies a new wave nationwide. Uh, there have been some cities with upticks in murders. You've probably seen the press on that. Right? Some cities, frankly, are not getting the coverage because they have a downtick. Right? But five months, nine months, no. That's not a trend. I don't know what it is, but at least wait for a year's worth of data, for God's sake. Right? This isn't it. All right, but let's, let's take those points. New York, LA, murders of police, one at a time. All right? uh, the evidence in New York. Right? Uh, and this is as of May 30th, 2014. Right? Um, the homicide rate in New York was still historically low. You compare it to almost any year, the first five months of 2015 compared, it showed, it showed a very low homicide number, uh, certainly looking back 20 years, over the, this 20-year decrease. All right? Uh, in fact, the first five months of 2015, uh, the total number of homicides in New York was actually 30% lower than the total in 2010. All right? So there was no real sense that homicides were skyrocketing. There had been kind of a spike. They were up. But as of August 31st, if you look at three more months of numbers, uh, we have a homicide rate in New York that is roughly on pace with 2014. No real difference. And then we had at the very end of the summer this. Um, more data. Uh, we find robberies, burglaries, and larcenies. Serious crimes that also get reported, they show big declines. Not just in the first five months, but all through this year. Big declines in all three of these major crime categories over what were already very low numbers for 2014. So they're going down, they're really diving. So in order to believe that there's a Ferguson effect, you gotta account for the fact that, well, maybe murders have gone up a little, but the Ferguson effect made these go down? I mean, if police are being backed off by these protests and this anger at police, it's gotta affect both of these things. It can't just affect murders, right? So. Explain that to me. I don't know what the answer is. And here, this was Commissioner Bill Bratton of the NYPD just 10 days ago making an announcement. Uh, safest summer in 25 years. He says, yep, the beginning of the summer we had a little jump in homicides, but across the last three months, the summer months, when by the way, crime usually goes up, it has been the safest we have seen in 25 years. Now, Bratton's a police commissioner, you know, maybe that's in his interest to say that, but he can't make this up and not have people check it, all right? So, homicides up? Nah, not really. Other crimes? Actually down. I don't think the evidence supports this claim. How about Los Angeles? 
Murders up in Los Angeles in the first five months of the year. That was the claim. Well, as of May 30, 2015, actually homicides in LA were down. They were not up, they were down, almost 15%. Now, you get to the end of August, which is the last time I got to look, and they're up. They're actually up 9%, and this was largely because there was a terrible, bloody August, for reasons nobody yet understands in Los Angeles, a lot of shootings and murders. All right? So they're up 9% now. All right, so tell me, tell me, by December 31st of this year, will the numbers be up? Will they be down? Will it be about the same? I guess we better wait till the trend actually shows up. Be sure, first off, we've got to be sure of our numbers. We don't want to be calling something up when it's actually down. But wait, I mean, you just can't make a judgment on a nationwide crime wave and use this as evidence. It's going up, it's going down. There's flex, there, the, these, these things go up and down across time. You can only draw real information out of them if you look across a sufficient amount of time, usually years. That's why we talk in terms of the crime drop over 20 years. That actually makes sense. All right, next point, murders of police officers. Remember, the claim is that murders of police officers went up 89% in 2014. I don't dispute that. There, that is the evidence. But I want to show you some more, too. Murders of police so far in 2015 are down. It's not ambiguous. They're not the same. They're not up. They're down. Okay? Here's the evidence. This comes from the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial Fund, which tracks this terrible activity over time. Uh, this uh, chart here, this tracks from September 1st, I'm sorry, from January 1st to September 3rd of both 2014 and 2015. So we have, a, in time-wise, time we have a direct apples-to-apples apples comparison, all right? So you see that total fatalities for police officers are actually up in 2015, looking at 2014. They're up 15%. But if you want to talk about murders of police officers, firearms-related deaths of police officers in the line of duty, and that's where the murders are, they're down. They're down 16%. This uptick in police officers' deaths is coming from traffic accidents, traffic accidents, and other causes. Those are up substantially. That's what accounts for the rise in police officer deaths. It's not murder. It's not to trivialize any police officer being murdered or assaulted. I don't do that. I wouldn't do that. But the evidence doesn't back up the claim. So why did she say that? And I already said, I don't dispute her evidence. Well, let me show you. Here's a chart. Ah, 10 years. We actually can draw a trend here. The last bar all the way over on the right side is 2014. And you see it's right next to 2013. And it's substantially higher. There was an 89% rise in murders of police officers in 2014 as compared to 2013. Correct. But... How does it fit in across those years? Because when you look at this, what you see is that 2013 was an historically low year for murders of police officers. If you look at the general run of this, 2014 was about what it has been over the past 10 years. Right? There's one outlier number where they're up, that's 2011, that one's really high, and one where they're really down, 2013. But the general run is just right about the level of 2014. So she's not wrong to claim that, 89, that uh, there was an 89% increase in police officer deaths in 2014, but it's misleading. And it does not reflect what we're seeing this year, not at all. So the Ferguson effect, what is it? Uh, let's take a multiple choice test. Is it a misinformed or fact-free analysis? Is it an effort to shift the blame to those protesting against police for whatever is going on? Is it offensive to every good police officer in the United States? 
And I got to say, I work with a lot of police officers. I work with a lot of police departments. I know them. Um, I have relationships with them. Um, the idea that those people would be backed off by folks saying bad things about them, that they would hesitate to do their jobs in a thorough and correct way because people are saying nasty things about them, that is offensive. I just, I don't accept it. And I don't think a lot of police do either. All of the above? You decide. There's no correct answer as far as I'm concerned. You pick for yourself. All right, the Ferguson effect, or black, as the National Review said recently, I didn't have time to get this into the slides, black lives matter costs black lives. Right? That, that's the bottle it's in now. Right? All I'm saying is look at the data. Don't accept these assertions that get made over and over, louder and louder. That's not the answer to really understanding the problem. Okay. How are we doing? Last point. Now we go directly to race. Okay? And somebody put this very pithily. Are cops racist? That somebody was your next speaker, Heather McDonald, who wrote the following, this book, you see the cover, is Are Cops Racist? And the subtitle, which you probably can't read, is How the War Against the Police Harms Black Americans. Right? So the fact that we're declaring war and calling police racist and things like that, that harms black people because it stops the police from doing the job of protecting black people. That's the claim in this book. So are police racist? I'll give you my answer. Police are no more or less racist than all of us. Right? They're just people. They're just people. Okay? And I, I can't think of anybody who's put this better than a guy I worked with in the Pittsburgh Police Department. His name is Ed Trapp. Ed's a lieutenant. He's been on that police department uh, maybe 25 years. He has many leadership roles within the police department. I'm working on, with him right now on the, the internal body camera task force. Uh, and I think he puts this really well. Here's what he says. The day police are better than the rest of us is the day they stop making police out of people. I can't argue with that. The, re the way to understand race and policing, or race and anything else in the United States now is not by thinking of sort of this old school bigotry, the use of the N-word, all that stuff. It's something else. When we think about race now, we ought to be asking, how does racial bias manifest itself? If it does, how does it manifest itself? What do we know about that? That's the real question. It's not about police, it's about human beings. The answer is implicit bias. We are into roughly 20 years of solid replicated research on this topic, implicit bias. And what this means is unconscious bias in the minds of almost everyone in the United States, probably elsewhere too, but what we measure is Americans. Right? What we're talking about are biases we don't even know we have, that we don't intend, that we don't activate consciously, that we don't even know they're there. But when we make decisions and we come to conclusions about people and we use their group, racial identity, ethnic, whatever it is, implicit bias is what influences that. Another word for this, of course, is stereotyping. Right? The scientists have a new term for it, implicit bias, and it really is quite descriptive of where it lives in the mind and how it works. But this is the old concept of stereotyping. Now, how do we know? How do we know that this is there? How did they kind of discover this? How have they measured it? The IAT, how many are familiar with the IAT? Right, a few hands, right? The Implicit Association Test. This test was developed almost 20 years ago by this group of scientists, what it allows us to do at this point and, and for years before is to measure for the presence and strength of implicit bias. Its tools are simple. It is an online test, well you could take it offline too, it uses your computer. All you need is a screen, a keyboard, and a computer. The test is broken down into several tasks. And in the test, you are shown partial faces. That's what's in the screen up there. 
you can see that some of them are easily identifiable as black, and some of them are easily identifiable as white. You are also shown a series of terms, of, pro of uh, you know, sort of concepts, words, uh, some of which are strongly positive and some of which are strongly negative. Examples of the positive or good words, joy, love, peace, wonderful, pleasure, glorious, laughter, happy, stuff like that. The bad ones, agony, terrible, horrible, nasty, evil, awful, fail failure, hurt. All right? You're shown the faces and the words in different combinations. And the task you are given is to match according to instructions. Your keystrokes, use your keystrokes left and right to match African American faces to good words or concepts and or European American faces to bad words or concepts or the opposite or the opposite. It's different points in the test according to your instructions. And the computer records how often you get it right, how often do you get the assigned task right if the assigned task is match the African American face to the good term. How often do you get that right and how fast do you do it? Right? Fingers on the keyboard. And you're, you're told do it as rapidly as you can. Rapidly as you can. Don't stop, don't think, just do it. And so you go through this series of tasks. Now, you're shown a number of different screens and have a number of different tasks. Some of these tasks are stereotype congruent, way of saying they are consistent with the existing stereotype. So if the existing stereotype is African Americans bad or negative, that's a, that's a stereotype congruent task. If the existing stereotype is white, good, that's consistent with the stereotype. And then they flip it around. White's bad, inconsistent with the stereotype, so on and so forth. And they measure it. They measure it. And they measure the accuracy of what you do and the speed of what you do. You can take this test. It's online. It's free. It's anonymous. You do give your demographic information. And you get results at the end that tell you something about your own preferences. But here is how, over millions of administrations of this test, here's how it looks. Right? Uh, what this is attempting to measure is the hidden preferences for white people over black people, or black people over white people, either one. It'll measure whatever is there. And here is what the results show. Over 80% of all test takers show a preference for white people over black people. Their implicit bias is for white people. Breaks down at least 75 to 80 percent of whites and 40 percent of black people too. A lot of people find that surprising. And these implicit biases, they operate even in people who have conscious egalitarian beliefs, who sincerely would tell you, I believe everybody's the same, should be treated the same, it's, nobody should get unfair treatment in the justice system or otherwise, the biases can still be there and they still can affect behavior. That's the important point. This is not a judgment on character. This is not you are bad or you're a nasty person or you're a racist person. This is about things that are going on that you don't even know, but they can affect your behavior and the effect on the person you're across from can be significant. Right? Here's where you can take it online. I know you can't copy this down. Just go project implicit. Put that in your browser. You'll go right to the test. All right? Now, where does this come from? Especially with black people, right? Where does this come from? It comes from the fact that we all grow up in the same American cultural soup. The soup is my word. All right? We're all soaked in the same culture from the time we, we are born and become conscious all the way through our lives. All right? The American culture. And that culture features messages, some explicit, some implicit. How many times you turn on the local news? What's the first story? First story, the, the rule of local TV news, if it bleeds, it leads. All right? So crime, especially bloody crime, is always first. Ratings, right? no big surprise. How many times has that lead set of images looked like this to you? Now, it's not that they never feature white criminals. But think of the prevalence of these images. How many times this is what you see first in 
television, newspapers, internet, wherever you go, they lead with this kind of stuff. And oftentimes, the images of white people, even involved in crimes, don't look like this. They're not being led out of the police station in handcuffs. They don't have a suspect on them. They look much different. They're a lot more neutral. Right? And, and if you think I'm taking the news media to task, hey, entertainment is just as good. Grand Theft Auto, anyone? Want to listen to some rap? All, right? All this stuff is sold to us and given to us and played for us, and it comes in the messages of the people who raise us, who relate to us, our friends, people we hardly know. It's everywhere. And by the time you are an adult, it's in there. All right? Now, people react differently. I'm not saying everybody comes out the same, but that's where it comes from. It's a cultural thing, and that's why it's so easy to measure across a vast population and have it show up. Now, implications for policing. Does it have direct input? Yes, it does. All right? And here's one example. Police training often uses simulators. All right? And some of them are quite good. I've done a couple of them. Uh, here's one that is often used for the, uh, to simulate the, the question of whether you shoot or not. All right? This person who's in the position of police officer holding a, uh, a faux firearm right, uh, is seeing a screen. Sometimes the screens are real big, too. Uh, and on that screen, there's a man. The man is approaching. The man's in a public place like a park or a mall or something like that. And the man suddenly presents himself with an object in his hand. All right? uh, the men could be white or black, and they alternate them. They could, they're always in public areas. And they might have a gun, and they might have something else that's shiny and metal, like a soda can or a cell phone. All right? And all of these scenarios are interchangeable. Sometimes the person is white, sometimes black. Sometimes a gun, sometimes no gun. And if police officers are presented with this scenario, and they have to decide, do they shoot or not? And they have to do it rapidly. Right? The test, the simulator, measures both the speed and the accuracy of the decision. Right? How quick are you to shoot, and how often are you shooting at the armed person versus the unarmed person? And because you can change the races and you have them intermixed in these scenarios, you can actually measure whether there's a race effect. Is there an implicit bias happening? Uh, this study by Carell and colleagues was really a pioneer in this area, and it was quite, quite revealing. Here's what they found. Number one, when you had a black subject on a screen, the police officer in training was quicker to shoot armed and unarmed black subjects than to shoot white subjects. Just faster, all right? Number two, they were less accurate as far as that decision with black subjects. So they were more likely to shoot unarmed black subjects than unarmed white subjects. Conclusion they came to? More black unarmed subjects will be shot than unarmed white subjects. Does that sound like anything we've heard in the last 12 months? Right. Uh, but here's the thing, and I don't know why this wasn't a feature of the conclusions, but I read this and something came to me. It also stands for the proposition that white armed subjects are going to get different treatment. Police officers are going to react to them more slowly and is less likely to shoot them. You know? And what does that mean? That person gets a shot at the police officer or members of the public. This is dangerous. I mean, this is really dangerous. Now, in a follow-up study, I don't have, really have time to go into, they, paired, they, they tested police officers again, and they tested civilians. Okay? The police officers showed the same degree of bias. Civilians were worse. All right? So it seems like the police training actually ameliorated some of this. All right? But this is, this is called the shooter bias. Right? Are we left with nothing to do about this? No, I don't think so. Um, there are two things that really stand out when we talk about race and implicit bias. Number one is awareness. Maybe three, I'm sorry. Awareness. You become aware of this, your, your own conscious beliefs can emerge. And you're less controlled by the unconscious things going on in your mind. Training makes a difference. That's the essence of that other follow-up study, because they showed that police officers with training had less bias than civilians. Then they put the civilians through the police training. The civilians 
had less bias after the training. Right? And then learning about other cultures so you don't automatically suspect people who look differently than you of being dangerous. Right? And I would say that cultural competence, we think race, we think ethnicity, I would think age. All right? I've seen a wonderful program in Baltimore in which young people, teenagers, are actually training police officers about how to interact with teenagers. It seems to work. So that's a lot. I think these are the four things to think about now, though. History, prosecution, why it's so hard, what is this thing called the Ferguson effect, and what's the real role of race. Remember what I said in the beginning. Race is certainly part of this, but it's not all about race. It's all about how we're going to go forward with policing and public safety in the 21st century. If we aren't partners, if there's not a partnership between police and the people they serve, if they're at odds in a big way, we all lose that much we can all agree on. I really thank you for having me here. This has been a great, great pleasure. Thank you. I know, I know many of you will have to go. You have classes to run to, so feel free, but I'm here to answer questions now. So put your hands up, sir, in the third row. Oh, yes, there's a lot of information. Let me repeat the question. Stop and frisk. Uh, in, uh, in many cities, I mean, police use stop and frisk, and it's legal, by the way. The Supreme Court says it can be done as long as it's done correctly. In New York is where the action has been on this, and there are years' worth of data on who gets stopped, what they get stopped for, what happens afterwards in terms of whether contraband or a gun or something is found. And what, what this data, years and years of data, and it's by 2011, the NYPD was stopping almost 700,000 people a year. 700, this, this, it was at 100,000 at the, at the end of the Giuliani years, which everybody thought was, wow, that's a lot. By the time you get to 2011, under three terms of Bloomberg and Kelly, it's almost 700,000. And what they found is, number one, in a significant portion of those stops, there is no legal cause. None written down and none that can even be imagined from any report that they have. So in a significant number of cases, they're stopping them without any reason at all. Number two, it's overwhelmingly minorities who are taking the brunt of this. Number three, when they stop whites, they're more likely to find contraband than when they stop minorities. All right, so all the effort, 88% of the stops, something like that, is going into stopping young black men, young Latino men. But the stops of white people are actually finding contraband at a much higher, at a noticeably, measurably higher rate. Right? The claim with this action was this is the thing that's kept New York City safe from murders, murders going down. You cannot do without this intense stop and frisk. It's been a, a, a pillar of the New York police policy since the Giuliani years. And when the, the, there was a case that was brought against this, it went to federal court, and as the judge was getting ready to make his decision, her decision, excuse me, um, I think the mayor and the police commissioner read the handwriting on the wall, and they began to really editorialize, Judge, don't you dare, don't you dare restrict New York City police officers from doing this. This tactic is responsible for at least uh, a reduction of 600 murders. I mean, they're putting numbers on it, all kinds of things. Well, the judge came out and said, uh, look, I, I'm not stopping you from doing stop and frisk. I couldn't. It's legal but you are doing it unconstitutionally, and that will change. Ah, sky's going to fall, blood's going to run in the streets. No. All crime in New York is down, homicides up a little, then down, mostly just historically low. So there's plenty of data on this, and how it goes wrong, and why it's a waste of resources. The number of guns seized is actually quite tiny, though so that is the state of stated objective of the program. Yes, it does that create the, the, the tension and the bad feelings? Absolutely. You talk to people in New York City uh, and you know they're grateful that crime is down, but you know when you can't send the grandson down to the bodega for a quart of milk without getting thrown up against a wall, I mean who wants to live with that? There's got to be a better way. In the back, sir.
Um, just to follow up on that, I'm reading Matt to book The Divide and partway through it, and he, it's not just stopping, it's the, uh, the summons quotas and the arrest quotas that, that police officers deal with until they're, they're, they're trying to find somebody to take down town. Yes. And that seems to me a much more serious thing than just stopping Christy and say you're on your way. Yeah, um, this is a very good point. There's, there's well-documented evidence at this point that the patrol officers, the people on the street, were actually squeezed. They maybe didn't want to do all this, some of them might have, but they were getting intense pressure from the people running the precincts. We're getting intense pressure from the people running the district commands all the way from the top. Produce more numbers. And this effectively was a quota. And they were told, you're going to have 20 stops a month and X number of frisks and so on and so forth, and you're going to write citations. And so it's not, you're right, it's not only getting stopped, getting frisked, it's these you know, little tickets and things that cause you to have to pay fines and go to court and maybe lose your job. Yes, sir. Justice uh, Harris, are there any demographics uh, comparing south to north, uh, you know, from different regions or as excessive force or the stats you have? Yeah, a really good question. Are there demographics that break down excessive use of force by region or by, here's the answer, no. All right, here's a very surprising thing. We don't have good data on use of force on any kind of national basis. Congress passed a statute back in 1994 that said, police departments, send us use of force data so that we can measure this. There's a lot of public concern, 1994. Here's the thing, American policing is highly decentralized. The Department of Justice can tell the FBI what to do and the ATF and the Capitol Police, but they can't tell the Toledo police what to do, except that they can't operate unconstitutionally. And most police departments simply ignored this. Those that did send it in, sent it in in, in, in very different forms, couldn't compare it, very incomplete, so on and so forth. It's a disaster for this country to have these issues before it now and no good national data on the use of force. The best you do is that some police departments have comprehensive record keeping on this, and, they are, and some of them are transparent. Not all of them, but some of them are. Yes, sir. Um, I actually uh, spoke with Heather McDowell years ago. We got a visual for you. And uh, she's at the Manhattan Institute. Yes, she is. And when I looked it up, if you pull her 990 tax form, she makes about $150,000 a year. And then she gets consulting PA. So she's cleared probably a half a million dollars to run around the country. So as I'm talking to her, so I'm like, well, wait, wait, basically you're saying that let's kill every young black dude and hunt us all down just because some of us are bad. Like, what you think we're going to do? You think everybody's just going to take this forever? But her, her thought was more, let's kill them all and let God sort them. That's how it all kind of came out. Yeah. That's just kind of how she is. So yeah. to me, racism is not, you know, somebody saying the name. Like, Paul Hogan, I don't think he's racist. He said they were, but that, that doesn't mean a man is racist. He just said something. To me, she's just truly racist because I've been watching her for years. So, what can you possibly do about somebody like that? Yeah, yeah. Here, this is, this is a very good question. Um, number one, I want to make clear uh, that I'm working for a lot less. Uh, <laughs> number two, I have also, I have debated her in, in various forums, and she is a very, very persuasive, good, polished speaker and a great writer, too. Um, and uh, I have been the subject of her writing as well. Um, but what can you do about it? Um, I don't know that there's anything you can do about it except get the other side out. Uh, I'm, you know, here, full confession, I was a person who suggested that she be the other speaker. Yeah. Right? Because I know she's going to give you, right? she's going to give you the other side. And she'll probably watch the video of this tell you why I'm an idiot too. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Just try to remember what was said here and don't take everybody's word for everything. But she's out there. We got to have other voices. That's the only answer. Like, I see Tim Wise, he'll talk about it. I see she'll talk about the police interaction. I see all these white people talking about the interaction of black people with police. Yeah. I don't see any black people pretty much going around talking about it. I'm afraid. Um, yeah, there may be that. Uh, maybe that. Are you, academics? I mean, I don't see oh, that. yes. There are many academics who are doing this. There's a good friend of mine, uh, 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 Tracy Macklin at Boston uh, University Law School, who's been doing this since before I was a professor. There are, there are many. The question is, do they get the same kind of platform and the same kind of attention 
uh, and it may be that the answer is no. Ma'am. Um, when you uh, first started speaking about rules of, en of engagement, yes, ma'am. I always feel that you need everybody at the table or at the conference, and it was kind of offensive to me that the chief of police was here and he left. You know, and I thought this was kind of something he should have stayed for to the end. Uh, well, just a I, just a yeah. observation. Okay. Um, I just met him today, um, and I hope that I have a chance to work with him and interact with him. Um, I noticed he was here for most of it, uh, but you know, lots of people have other obligations. I'm sorry, and he, and he can see it on the internet, right? So you're here, so point it out to him when they get it up on the YouTube channel. He can see the rest. Yes, sir. Uh, first of all, as far as I am a fourth-year student at the University of College of Law, I'm a law enforcement officer. I do instruct use of force tactics uh, at the police academy and for our agency. Uh, and we all got kind of a little laugh about Ms. McDonald's use of trends. But even in the Cleveland's uh, DOJ report, they talk about patterns and practices. And it says that the court does not need a specific number of incidents to find a pattern or practice. So the DOJ is not necessarily going off trends. Their patterns can be any, any type of pattern. I guess my second point would be, when it comes to implicit bias, how would we know whether the Department of Justice and their Civil Rights Division, when they're investigating use of force complaints, don't have their own implicit biases against police officers because they are actually looking for civil rights violations? Okay, two very good questions. First issue, pattern and practice. That's actually a legal term of art that comes from a federal statute, uh, 42 U.S.C. 14141, also in 1994, passed as the same part, as part of the same crime bill. Uh, and what that says is that the Department of Justice has the authority to go in and investigate any police department to see if there is a pattern or practice of unconstitutional policing. And it very pointedly, the statute does not give a number, does not give any kind of a, you know, it must be one year's worth, two years worth. So I think the statement in the, in the Cleveland report, which I also read, uh, I think that statement really, what they're trying to say is there's no number that, it could, that we would or could attach to this, but we see a pattern. And frankly, they should be able to identify a pattern, maybe a geographic pattern, maybe a pattern where certain officers are engaged in this over time. Whatever it is, they have to have, it can't, in other words, can't be just one bad shooting or even two. It has to be some kind of a pattern. On your second point, might the Department of Justice uh, uh, lawyers also have their implicit biases? They no doubt do. They know, they're, they're human beings, just like police. But the cases, the federal cases of excessive use of force are actually investigated by law enforcement. They're not investigated by the lawyers. They're investigated by the FBI uh, and, and, and out, uh, field agents. They go out and they do the investigating and present that to the lawyers. So to the extent that there might be biases, maybe they can cancel each other out. I think I might be getting a hook here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.